In terms of getting this thing started, the secret weapon will soon walk into this room, I hope. Anyway, yeah, well, at least one did. <laughs> so, <clears throat> please take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. We are looking at church number one, the church at Ephesus. You know, we have Revelation chapters two and three are the letters to the seven churches. And we're still on church number one, the church at Ephesus, because it sets the stage for all of the other churches. The church at Ephesus is very much like this church. It was a reformed church. It was a doctrinal church. The letter to the, the epistle to the Ephesians, you know, it talks all about the sovereignty of God. It talks about predestination. It talks about election. It talks about all the things that are dear to our hearts. It was a doctrinal church, but it had lost its first love. And it was about to be jerked off the stage of history because it had lost its love for Christ. And that, of course, is the threat that we ourselves may face here in this church. So, reviewing quickly what we've covered in the first six parts, we're not going to go over all six of those, but just from the last time, we're still looking at Ephesus because we're looking at the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We also uh, see more about the Nicolaitans when we study the third church, which is the church at Pergamos. So let me give you a quick summary of the three points from last week. First, Ephesus had God's perspective on the Nicolaitans. Both God and the Ephesian church hated, not merely disliked or, you know, sort of tolerated, they hated the Nicolaitans. I want that to sink in. There are some things that God tells us we're supposed to hate. And God says, Thou hatest the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Pergamos did not. They tolerated. They embraced the Nicolaitans. Number two, the failure of Pergamos to literally hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans ended up producing lewd and licentious libertinism. And that will give us, by the way, a clue to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Uh, because that's the result of that doctrine. It's something we'll see more about when we get to the church at Pergamos because it's similar to and related to the Galatian heresy, and I'm not going to expound on that until we get to Pergamos. Number three, also central to our study is the fact that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is paralleled with the doctrine of Balaam, and the Bible has a lot to say about Balaam even though the information about the Nicolaitans is very scarce in the Bible, but because it is directly paralleled with the doctrine of Balaam, we can learn something about it, and we see that the doctrine of Balaam also resulted in lewd, licentious, lascivious behavior. So then, the second thing we saw was the methods that Satan used at Ephesus. They're different than the methods used at Pergamos. So a summary of that, Satan didn't live at Ephesus, though he did there, uh, we find him actually dwelling at Smyrna later on. The church at Ephesus had obviously taken Paul seriously and had tried to keep the pure doctrine in practice. But Satan gained two footholds at Ephesus that later resulted in doctrinal compromise. They were strong doctrinally. Satan said, how am I going to destroy that? Well, he used two methods to weaken them so that he could get in and infiltrate their doctrine. Does anybody remember the first method? I said it just a minute ago. They lost their first love. You know, when the passionate fire of love burns low, compromise takes place. You think about marriages. Passionate love burns low, and suddenly a person is open to temptation and to compromise. The love of the church is Ephesus. That's what Jesus faults them for. They had lots of good stuff, but... Satan managed to get in and cause them to lose their first love. Second thing. What's that? Yes, there was a split at Ephesus. We don't see it yet. Jesus doesn't mention it here in Revelation. It hadn't taken place yet, but Paul warned about it in, Ephes in excuse me, Acts chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, that there would eventually be a leadership conflict that split the church. Does Satan ever use church splits to get a foothold in churches? Hola, does he? Yes. Yeah. Hola, Paco? Yes? Okay. <laughs> yes, he does. Those are the two things that we see that precede what later happens in church history. There is an eventual leadership conflict 
that split the church, as Paul warned in Acts chapter 20. That brought us to a study of the doctrine of Balaam to analyze his deeds so that we can know what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were. Revelation 2.14, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now here we find what it was who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. And here's the parallel. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now last week I gave you the eight different errors or the eight points of apostasy where Balaam had defected and ended up in grotesque moral depravity. What was the very first error of Balaam? I preached on it this morning. First error of Balaam was, begins with a C, covetousness. The first error of Balaam was covetousness. In other words, Paul says covetousness is idolatry and the covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. The first error of Balaam was covetousness. And if you want to hear more about that, listen to the message from this morning. I think it's up on the internet already. The second error of Balaam was willingness to twist his access to God to please another human being. In this case, it was Balak, king of Moab. Twist access to God to please another human being. That's dangerous. There are a lot of people involved in religious activities that twist their access to God, or they try to anyway, to please somebody else. The third error of Balaam was mixing the knowledge of the true God with witchcraft and secondary demonic supernatural powers, because it specifically says he sought incantations. In other words, magic words. That's what an incantation is. The fourth error of Balaam was his pride. We know that because of his desire for the honor of man more than the honor of God. The fifth error of Balaam was testing God to see if God would change his opinion if Balaam kept stubbornly insisting on a different answer to the question where God had already said no. Has God ever said no to you? And you keep coming back, but well, I want it, Lord, I want it. This is what I want. Come on, God, I want it, I want it, I want it. And God says, no, no, no. He kept coming back. The sixth error of Balaam tied to that was making God a limited territorial God because he kept going to different places to try to find a better location for the curse or perhaps find a weak part of Israel that God would curse. Seventh error of Balaam was willingness to use what we would call his Bible knowledge concerning the holiness of God to accomplish what he could not do through a curse, teaching Balak how to make God judge his own people. The eighth error of Balaam connected to that seventh was Balaam's approval, condoning, and promotion of sexual immorality to accomplish his own ends. We saw last week that Balak already knew about Balaam because Balak initiated the contact with Balaam, who already had a reputation as a man who was in contact with the real God. But Balak was looking for witchcraft because it says his emissaries brought rewards of divination. They weren't trying to get in contact with the true God. They were trying to get Balaam to manipulate it, to make incantations. And Balaam was trying to please them to get their money and get their honor. God gave Balaam a clear statement of no on the very first appeal to curse Israel. Very clearly said, I'm not going to curse them. I'm going to bless them. But Balaam kept pushing past the warning signs. He rebelliously moved ahead. Like if you see a sign on the road, it's been raining heavily, you come up and there's a road sign in the middle of the road that says, bridge out ahead. Say, forget that. You drive around the sign. You come to another set of orange cones and flashing lights that say, bridge out ahead. You push on and you go after that, say, I gotta get to where I'm going. And you gun it and you come to one final side that says, 100 yards, the bridge is out, and you push past that. What is gonna happen to you? You got it. I'm glad somebody's listening over here. <laughs> All the rest I see out there, <laughs> snore, snore. Okay. So Balaam kept pushing God. God kept saying no. So finally God comes back with, you know, okay, go. And it's implied, see what happens if you go ahead and go. And we know what happens because when Balaam kept pushing, God let him go. And then the angel of the Lord stood in the way with a sword to slay Balaam, and the donkey saw it, 
and the donkey kept trying to save Balaam's life. And Balaam got mad at the donkey and started beating the donkey, and God opened the donkey's mouth. And then Balaam started to do stupid stuff, like talking to donkeys. You know, you think, now, wait a minute. Don't you catch on that something is going on? And so God opened Balaam's eyes, and then he saw the angel standing there with the sword in the road. Now, there was one important principle that we learned as we were studying this, that wicked people know that if they put enough pressure on you, eventually you will yield. So when you get pressure after giving a no answer to an unrighteous person, be very careful if they keep putting pressure on. A lot of Christians try to do this to force you to pressure you to do what you know is wrong. Say, but I'm not going to do it. Oh, come on, let's do it. No, it's wrong, but come on. And they push you and they push you and they give all kinds of reasons for it. You know, you may be dealing with a fake. It's wicked people, no matter how religious they seem, they will test you to see what is your compromise trigger. In Balaam's case, it happened to be a combination of money and honor. So the application for us, if you push God hard enough, you may think you have a green light, but when you move forward, you'll come under God's anger and then start doing stupid things like talking to donkeys. We also saw in the prophecies of Balaam that God had kept alive the memory of the Exodus 40 years earlier, Numbers 23, 22. God brought them out of Egypt. Here's Balaam in his prophecy, talk, and he's reminding them that God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination. These are witchcraft words. We studied the doctrine of witchcraft in the Bible and all the different words that are used in the Bible. This is about two years ago in the evening service, remember, when we were going through the book of Acts. And we were looking at the different sorcerers in the book of Acts. And we went through and we studied all the things that God is cursing and says, you may not do this as my people. Surely there's no enchantment against Jacob. Now there's any divination against Israel. That means that God sovereignly protects them, even though they've gone through horrendous times as chastening from the hand of God, yet God is going to keep his covenant promises with national Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God brought? First message over a telephone. Then we saw that Numbers 24 contains the blessings Balaam pronounced on Israel. Chapter 25 tells us how Balaam managed to get his reward. He used three-letter word, sex. That's how he managed to get his reward. We'll learn more, more about the fornication that Balaam taught Israel to commit when we get to the church at Pergamos. But we see the specific narrative in the book of Numbers. And it's clear from the New Testament that Balaam was personally responsible for what happened in this chapter. The New Testament tells us that Balaam was personally responsible for what happened in this chapter. Listen, Numbers 25, beginning in verse 1. So we've gone to Numbers 21, 22, 23, 24, and now we're at 25, and here it is. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. That's sex. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. Oh, they offer things sacrificed unto idols. Remember, we were just talking about that over in the book of Revelation. Those two sins, which are listed for us in verses 1 and 2, here in Numbers 25 are what are mentioned over in the book of Revelation. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. That means the Lord of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. That, that's a cultic prostitution, what was going on there. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle. Can you imagine the chutzpah? That's a Hebrew for unmitigated gall. The chutzpah of bringing this woman while the people are in front of the tabernacle weeping and repenting and he wanders in with this woman and goes into the tent. in the sight of Moses, in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. 
And when Pinchas, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, that's the grandson of Aaron, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation. He took a javelin in his hand. I don't know if any of you have ever been in sports, but I can remember back in the days when, when I was in track and field, and we had some guys who were really good with a javelin. I mean, they could throw it hundreds of feet. Man, I, every time I picture this, I pic picture him picking up one of those javelins. Mm. Dangerous little weapons. They use them for sports now. There were guys, I'm sure, throughout history who took spears and did the same thing when the enemy was approaching. And boy, if you got hit one of those, you're dead. Took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Kawoop! So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. One guy counts. One man doing what was right stopped the plague. Do you have the courage to be the one man who stands in the gap, who stops the plague, who takes the javelin and runs the enemy through? Look what God said about Phineas. A plague had already started. We didn't see it earlier in the chapter, but it tells us how many died. Verse 9. Those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Balaam knew how to kill the Israelites. And the king of Moab didn't have to raise a hand. And his Midianite allies didn't have to raise a hand. Balaam taught Balak how to do it. Just get those Israeli boys involved in sex related to the gods that you worship. And they'll have cultic worship that involved immorality and God will kill them himself. And that's precisely what happened. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Now listen to the blessing. Listen to the blessing that that one man, because he stood in the gap, because everybody else was weeping and wailing, and he stopped weeping and wailing, he says, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to sit and watch it happen and say, Oh God, stop them, stop them, please help God. I'm going to be the hand of God here. I'm going to be the one that stands up and participates. I'm going to be the activist. I'm going to be the one that goes out there and does something about it. People, we have a lot of stuff going on in our country today where people need to stand up and start doing something about it. Here's what God said. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. If Phineas hadn't done that, not only would Balaam have gotten his reward and his honor, but Balak would have won and not have had to risk one of his men in battle. One man stopped the counsel of Balaam. One man. Will you be a Phineas in this generation? It's all it takes. One man standing in the gap. There are a lot of times in history where one man has made a difference. Here's one where God had blessed it. Wherefore say, now here's God's promise. Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. Does God ever break his covenants? Never. And listen to how far it goes. And he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for God and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. 
I suspect that the descendants of Phineas don't know that they are descendants of Phineas. But God knows who they are. God has made a covenant of peace with Phineas. Generation after generation after generation. Through all of the persecutions that Israel's gone through, all the times of chastening, God said, I made a covenant of peace with him. And it's going to extend and extend and extend. And someday, God is going to raise up, according to the book of Ezekiel, during the millennial reign of Christ on earth, he's going to reinstitute the sacrifices. Not because they are necessary as in the Old Testament, but as a memorial for what God has accomplished and as a memorial for the work of finished work of Christ on the cross. And you know who are going to be among the priests who minister? Aaron was the high priest. And then Eliezer. And then Pinchas. Phineas. And a covenant of everlasting peace to him. Oh, people, what blessings we get when we obey God. When we stand for his truth. When we stand for moral purity when we stand for righteousness, when we refuse to compromise, even though everybody else may be weeping about it, we say, God has called me to do something about it. And we move forward in the strength of God, in the power of the Spirit, to the glory of God. And he gives us his blessing. I wish we had time to spend on that. But it tells us who, ha who this happened to. The name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of the chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, not Bill. <laughs> Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was the head over a people and of the chief house of Midian. These are big name people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them. For they vex you with their wiles, whereby they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague of Peor's sake. Now, Balaam did get his reward. They killed 24,000 Israelites and didn't cost them anything. Balaam taught Balak what to do to get God to judge his own people. So he got what he wanted. He got his money, he got his honor, but he only enjoyed it for a very short time. Because the Bible records for us just six chapters later what happened. This is Numbers 31, beginning of verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel, the Midianites, afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. So Moses gets the privilege of being the one who leads against the Midianites. Of course, you know he's going to turn over the cloaked to Joshua a little bit later, but Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Now, they're going to deal with Moab later on. But right now, it was the Midianites. Moab and Midianites were allied, and it was the Midianite women that came into the camp under the example, or rather the teaching of Balaam, that caused this sin. Avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to the war. So there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phineas, <coughs> the son of Eleazar the priest, to war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. God honored Phineas, the priest, with a military assignment. You're courageous. Everybody saw what you did. You're not afraid to stick those fornicators through with a spear. You're going to lead the charge. Now, Phineas could say, well, yeah, but there were only two of them. They weren't armed, and, you know, they weren't paying attention to what I was about to do. <clears throat> he didn't use that kind of an excuse. God gave him a position of leadership. Did you know, as you begin to move through the Old Testament, you discover that the priests always were at the forefront of the battle with the Ark of the Covenant and blowing the ram's horns. We see this at Jericho. We see it later on when, unfortunately, the Ark of the Covenant was, was taken. But we discover the priesthood was stationed around the country. When they were given their inheritance of the different Levitical cities, 
where they were scattered around Israel, we discover that each of those was a military fortification. They were to lead in warfare. What a different concept that we have today where chaplains are not allowed even to carry a weapon. They have to go unarmed. That's pretty courageous to go into battle without any kind of weapon. But uh, medics, the same thing. But they are leading in a spiritual warfare for the souls of the men that are under their care. And there are a lot of apostates in there that are not true chaplains of God. There are some that are faithful. They're getting a lot of pressure put on them to conform to the so-called modern idea of sodomy in the military and transgenders in the military and all kinds of other perversions in the military. And if they don't kowtow to the politically correct position, they get court-martialed. That's for another message. Here we have Eliezer the priest going to war with the holy instruments, with the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. Now look at verse 8. And they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Now listen to the last phrase in verse 8. Balaam also the son of Beor they slew with the sword. He got his money. He got his honor. It only lasted a couple of months. You see, God keeps records. God knows who's doing what and when they're doing it. God knows those who are compromising, and God knows those who are teaching people that it's okay to compromise, and they will get nailed. That's what we learn about Balaam. Remember, the book of Revelation is talking about the doctrine of Balaam. It's talking about the lewd and lascivious practices of Balaam. And the children of Israel took all... Now listen to this. Boy, this is really interesting when we get down through the next seven verses. The children of Israel took all the women of Midian, captives and their little ones, and took the spoil of their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods, and they burned all the cities wherein they dwelt, and all their goodly castles with fire. They took all the spoil and all the prey, both men and of beasts, and they took all the... Uh, brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eliezer the priest and under the congregation of the children of Israel and of the camp of the plains of Moab which is by Jordan near Jericho and Moses and Eliezer the priest and all the princes of the congregation by the way notice it's near Jericho the people in Jericho are going to be hearing about this and Rahab the harlot later says that to the spies and Moses and Eliezer the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host. Hey, we just won the war. What's the matter? What's the matter, Moses? With the captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. Why do you think Moses was upset? <laughs> it tells you in verse 15 and 16. Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel now listen to the next phrase. Through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. There is no question what the doctrine of Balaam was. And there is no question what the result of the doctrine of Balaam was. He taught them to commit Fornication. Through the counsel of Balaam. These caused the children of Israel, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Okay, so that finishes up what I'm going to say about the Old Testament. Let's look over at the New Testament now. Balaam is also set forth as an example of wickedness in the New Testament for at least four reasons. Four reasons for Balaam being set forth as an example are given in the New Testament. Number one, a doctrine that we love very much. But remember, so did the church at Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus ultimately crumbled and got jerked out of its place. Number one, Balaam abandoned godly separation. He abandoned the doctrine of separation. You know, it's painted on the, you know, behind the choir loft in the church come out from among them and be ye separate and the whole thing says and touch not the unclean thing 
and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Be ye separate. He abandoned the doctrine of separation. If this church, if this denomination ever abandons the doctrine of separation, we're in for the same kind of trouble that the children of Israel got through the council of Balaam. Number two, he defiled morally pure character, and he did it deliberately. He deliberately defiled morally pure character. He knew what would cause God to judge Israel. And he said to Balak, look, I can't, I can't curse him. God won't let me do it. But I know God. See, he knew what the true God was like. It wasn't like the pagan gods. The pagan gods loved to use sex as in part of their worship, and that would get the worshipers to pay money into their treasuries and all that kind of stuff. He deliberately defiled morally pure character. Number three, and the New Testament sets this forth for us, he clutched at worldly conformity. He wanted to be like everybody else. He clutched at worldly conformity. He wanted honor and money. Isn't that the great American dream? Money and goal is your goal? So you're going to fit into society. You don't want to make any waves because you want to get money and position and prestige and retire with a big bank account where you don't have to worry about anything. Be careful. You may be moving toward the doctrine of Balaam. Number four. He taught a perversion of what today we would call so-called Christian liberty. It's okay with God if you do this. There is genuine Christian liberty. There is fake Christian liberty. Now, I've preached on that in the past, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more probably next week. I don't think we'll get to it tonight. But what is the difference between Christian liberty and libertinism? What's the difference between Christian liberty and license? The New Testament is very clear about Christian liberty and the boundaries of Christian liberty. Too many people say, well, I have liberty to do this because I'm saved. I can't lose my salvation. And after all, I'm a mature Christian. I can handle it. It's like going out and having a cocktail with somebody. People, Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do because what you want to do is the flesh. Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. Remember the difference. Not the right to do what you want to do, but the power to do what you ought to do. There is the freedom. You are not bound by sin. You are not held by its cords. The Holy Spirit enables you to break through, and there is your liberty in Christ doing what God called you to do. So, four things, four reasons. Abandoned godly separation, deliberately defiled morally pure character, three, clutched at worldly conformity, and four, taught a perversion of so-called, what we would call, Christian liberty. His decadent moral teaching is seen in the matter of Peor, that's how the scripture phrases it, where he taught Balak to send in the beautiful girls of Moab and Midian to commit fornication with the Israelites so that God himself would judge them, even if he, Balaam, could not curse the Jews. Now, Let's look at some of these New Testament passages. Both Jude and Peter set him out as the epitome of apostasy. Now those are two very important epistles because they both deal with the last days. This is something that we in the church can expect in the last days. Jude and 2 Peter both deal with with apostasy in the last days. And Balaam is one of the principal examples of it, and we see it flooding the church today. Let me read it to you, beginning in verse 4 of Jude. For there are certain men crept in unawares, nor as they sneak into churches, you don't know who they are, but they get in, they pretend to be Christians, but listen to what God says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men 
Now listen, do you pick up anything in this next phrase? Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That's a big old English word, lasciviousness. You say, yeah, yeah, okay, lasciviousness, whatever in the world, lasciviousness. Yeah, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. No, so whatever in the world. That is abject, depraved immorality. They're teaching as Christian liberty that it's okay to be involved in various perversions. Did you know there are people today calling themselves evangelical Christians, among whom are evangelical Christian leaders, who are saying, well, after all, homosexuals do love one another, and so we have to recognize a, a theology of homosexuality, that this is a love given by God. Oh, people, give me a break. God says it's an abomination. It's decadent depravity of the grossest immoral order. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Well, Christ died for all those sins, so even if it's kind of bad, well, he'll forgive them anyway. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Go ahead and do it because after all, you know, let us sin that grace may abound. Paul says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? They turn the grace of God. Can you imagine the grace of God? In the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Ah, when you get into that, all of a sudden you're hitting the heart doctrines of the faith. You begin to deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The heart of the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, and Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Be very careful. Immorality leads to false doctrine. Because you will believe what fits your theology. And you will live by what fits your theology. Theology always affects practice, and practice always affects theology. You cannot separate the two. That's the point of the doctrine and deeds of the Nicolaitans at Ephesus and Pergamos. The two things are mentioned, their doctrine and their deeds. And they're inseparable. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he takes us back to the wilderness wanderings. He takes us back to the Exodus in verse 5. I will put you therefore in remembrance, though you want, he once knew this, how that the Lord, so knows you can have something in your head that you forget in terms of your practice, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, that's the Exodus. So we're moving into the wilderness wanderings. That's where we find Israel when they're in contact with Balaam and Balak, Moab and Midian, Afterward, destroyed them that believed not. Let's stop for a minute. Most people think there are about two million Jews that left Egypt. I suspect they were closer, and that's figuring on the basis of 1.8 kids per adult um, couple. <laughs> Listen, they didn't practice birth control back then like they do now. Uh, they were having as many kids as they possibly could. I suspect it was closer to a minimum of six million people that left Egypt. Of those that left Egypt, who were aged 20 and above, assuming there were only two million adults that left Egypt, of those aged 20 and above, the adults that left Egypt, how many of them got to cross the Jordan River? Two. Two. 
Yehoshua and Kalev, Joshua and Caleb. Even if you only got two million adults, that's one in a million odds. You wouldn't want to bet your life savings on one in a million odds. So we start in this passage in Jude with the Exodus. And then he moves to something that happened in the angelic realm. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. We find an angelic judgment. And then we find another illustration of God's wrath being poured out. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, they were practicing sodomy. Quote, homosexuality. The cities about them in like manner, Sodom and Adama and Zboim, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. So here are three things are set forth for an example. Now Paul tells us all the things that happened to Israel in the wilderness were given as an example so we shouldn't fall into the same sins. I'm going to be preaching on that next Sunday, the Lord willing. So I won't give it to you now. But these three illustrations, Exodus from Egypt, angels that rebelled with Satan, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the other Sodomite cities, are set forth for an example what happened to them. Last phrase of verse 7. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And he puts it in the present tense. Even though it's at least 1,400 years before. They didn't get consumed. They didn't get annihilated. They were still burning. A lot of people teach annihilationism. A lot of the cults teach annihilationism. The Bible does not teach annihilationism. It does not teach a mythical hell or a figurative hell. It teaches a literal hell. It said they are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They were still burning when Jude wrote this. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers, these apostates, the certain men who are crept in unawares, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. We're back to sexual immorality. Despise dominion. They rebel against authority. They speak evil of dignities. They're always out there in the church trying to undermine leadership. When people come up to you with gossip, when they come up to you with bad-mouthing the pastor or the elders, be careful you may have somebody who is one of these men who has crept in unawares, a filthy dreamer, one who defiles the flesh, one for whom is reserved the vengeance of eternal fire. You say, yeah, yeah, okay, well, well, but, but come on, tell me, what about, what about Balaam? Well, okay, let's go. Yeah, Michael the archangel, so he's moving back now to the angelic realm. He'd started out with those with Egypt and all the sins of, e of uh, the Israelites in Egypt. Then he went to the angels, so now we're coming back to the angels. Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now remember, this wiping out of Midian was the last big deal that God was going to let Moses do before God took Moses home. So when Moses died, Satan was trying to get hold of his body. If he could have gotten Moses' body and regenerated it somehow, made it move, he could have done all kinds of damage to Israel. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, the things that animals do. In these things they corrupt themselves. Now verse 11, here's our key verse. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain... 
and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah, the way of Cain. Cain was the first murderer in the Bible. They ran greedily after the error of reward, uh, after the error of Balaam for reward. Tells you what number one problem with Balaam was. Remember, I told you the first error of Balaam was covetousness. They perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Remember, Korah and his company rebelled against Moses in the wilderness. They said, we will not do what you want us to do. And you remember how God destroyed part of them who came in to offer fire before the altar of the Lord. He had set a fire out of the Shekinah glory and he consumed them right there and they ended up taking those brass plates where they had the incense in it and beating them into a plate to cover the, the altar there so that everybody would remember when they saw it. Ooh, that's what God does to people who try to step out of line and rebel against authority. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. They attend your church dinners. <laughs> Interesting. They've had church dinners from the beginning, and from the beginning there have been people creeping in and taking advantage of that and taking the food for free and stuffing their faces, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds there are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, whose fruit without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And those these are really dead, dead, dead. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Someday I'll preach on Jude. And every one of these pictures has fantastic imagery that is reflected elsewhere in Scripture so you understand it. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam. So we know that the genealogies of the Old Testament are true. They don't skip a lot of stuff and they don't make it up as they go along. You go back to Genesis and you find out Enoch is the seventh from Adam talk a lot about that, the genealogy of the Old Testament. You say, oh no, don't talk about the genealogy tonight. Okay, prophesy to these saying, behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are, now listen how many times he uses ungodly here, all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. <laughs> you get the idea? And of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are people without God. But they're in the church. And they get into church leadership positions. And they begin to teach lasciviousness as if it were grace. Which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Ultimately all rebellion is against God. How can you tell who they are? Well, he tells you in verse 16. These are murmurers. Complainers. When you get into a church where there are people who are backbiting and murmuring and complaining and griping and be careful, you may have just uncovered one of the certain men or women who have crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Because this is one of the visible characteristics of those people. Murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Their mouth speak of the great swelling words. Oh, they like to pat you on the back. They like to pretend they're your friend. They want to know everything that you know. They want to be able to gossip with you and about you. People who are always digging for just a little more tidbit of information, which, oh, that is tasty. I can hardly wait to tell my friends. Oh, guess what I know about the pastor or the elders or somebody else in the church. You're going to love this. Let's pray about it. We've got to be spiritual, but let me tell you so we can pray about it. <laughs> oh, people. I've been in ministry for 45 years, almost 50 years. Yeah, 50 years. And I've seen this over and over and over and over. And over again. Murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Oh, we love you. Just be our friend and we'll talk about things together, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They will flatter you, they will butter you up, and they admire you for their own advantage. That's what he says. But, beloved, 
Remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Now here we see separation in a different light in verse 19. These be they who separate themselves sensual. In other words, get rid of the fundamentalists. Let's get away from the fundamentalist camp. Because he already talked about the fundamentalist camp up above. Now, these are the people who say, we can't put up with them. We don't want you to hear what they have to say. Come with us. Let's, we're separating ourselves. Let's go out and start our own little group here, which grows into a mega church. How do we know? Because of the very next word, sensual. Sensual. You know what sensuality is? He tells you if that's the way they walk and live, if that's where their doctrine ends, the last phrase tells you something about them internally. Having not the Spirit. Oh, my time is up. I can't believe this. Okay, I'm going to read the next passage just so you see where Balaam is there. I'm just going to read it. We'll hopefully get a chance to comment on it next week. But, I mean, you'll see all the same things that we saw about the doctrine of Balaam and what happened there in the book of Numbers. Okay, so now we have uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness, who despise government. Presumptuous there. I hope you're paralleling this with what we just saw over there in Jude. Self-will. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. They're always in rebellion against authority. Whereas angels, which are greater in power. So he's talking about angels also here, just like Jude did. Angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. These are as natural brute beasts. Same things that James was saying, made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things they understand not. They shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Here we have it. They come to your church dinners. <clears throat> Having eyes full of adultery. There we go. Sex practices just like Balaam that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Ha! <laughs> covetous practices! What do we got? Balaam again. Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. Now get it. Here's verse 15. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds they are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, here they are. Oh, we love you. They've got you in admiration. For advantage, they allure, that is, they tempt you, they pull you, through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who lived in error. Well, they promised them liberty. Here we have the false concept of Christian liberty that I talked about just a moment ago. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage. For if, after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now here is a serious warning. I wish we had time to talk about it. We don't. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Better not to know the truth than to know the truth and turn from it. And these guys know the truth, but they want something out of you. And they're willing, like Balaam, to compromise it so that they can get it. But what has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Well, they don't have time for the rest of this, but let's close in prayer. The Lord willing, we'll pick it up next week. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and for its power. It gives us serious warning because we see here the parallel, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans with the doctrine of the deeds of, of Balaam. Ephesus, had resisted it, Pergamos had yielded to it, and what chaos and con confusion and destruction happened. 
Satan used different methods to get at Ephesus, and he ultimately got some of the doctrine of Balaam to Ephesus as we see in church history. Help us to get to that next week, the Lord willing. Father, we thank you for the time we've had tonight. We pray for your blessings upon your word as it's gone forth, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our closing hymn for tonight. Let me find it. I oh, hope that wasn't my paper that just fell out. Okay. Let's turn to number 670, Out on the Highways and Byways of Life. <laughs> and you're going to face it.